and for our lives. The Bell Grove Missionary Baptist Church, 2300 Edgefield, Highway North, Aiken, South Carolina, invites you to join us every Sunday for a Truth and Triumph worship experience. Pastor Lester A. Smalls is a man with a testimony who preaches and teaches the gospel of Jesus Christ with such soundness and clarity even a baby can understand it. Seeking true worship, great fellowship, and sound doctrine? Join us at Bell Grove. We're located in North Aiken County. We are also convenient to the surrounding cities of Edgefield, Johnston, Ridge Springs, and North Augusta. Worship every Sunday with Sunday School at 9.30 a.m., Devotion and Praise at 10.30 a.m., and Call to Worship at 11 a.m. Also, join us for the Truth and Triumph Word Ministry every Monday night at 9 p.m. on WAAW 94.7 FM Radio. We can be reached at 803-649-1706 or bellgrovebaptist.org or on Facebook. My name is Luther Johnson, and today is November the 15th, 2020, and our Sunday school lesson is Confident Love. Our Bible background is going to be coming from 1 John, the third chapter, verses 11 through 24. 2 John, the first chapter, verses 4 through 11. 3 John. Chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Our printed text is going to be coming from 1 John, the 3rd chapter, the 11th through the 24th verse. Our devotional reading is going to be coming from Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 8. Aim for change. By the end of this lesson, we will explore the many dimensions of loving others according to 1 John 3. Embrace God's commandments to love with obedience and expectation and identify ways to grow in our faith in Jesus and our love for others. Let's go to our devotional reading. Again, it's Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 8. Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 8. And it reads, let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed under fire. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follows considering the outcome of their conduct. And verse number eight, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. May the Lord have a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy word. Let us pray. Father God, we come now in the name of Jesus. Father God, we just come on this day, oh God. First, just giving you thanks for you being God and God all by yourself. We thank you, God, that you sit high and you look low. You rule and you super rule and you have all power in your hand. On this day, oh God, we just invite your Holy Spirit into this lesson, oh God, that you would just have your way, oh God, that you would direct us and that you would guide us, oh God the way that you would have us to go. Bless every reader, Lord God. Bless every student, Lord God. Let your word come forth with power on this day. Let your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. 
on this morning. Uh, this lesson is kind of a continuation from last week's lesson uh, about abiding in love. And we're going to see some of those comparisons as we get along um, throughout this lesson on this day. But just a, a little bit of uh, background about what we're going to be discussing on today. Um, we know that we, uh, last week, we were in the Gospel of John. Uh, this week, uh, we're going to be in the Epistle of John, or letter, uh, his letter to the churches at Edifice. Uh, a little bit of background of why John even wrote this letter. Uh, this letter was written to the members of the churches in Asia Minor. The epistle served as a reminder to the children of God to love one another. The apostle John is prepared to show the church how to put love, the love of God into action. This commandment to love is an expression of how Christ's disciples should act. This love has been shed abroad by the Holy Spirit in, our, in their hearts. Without showing the love towards others, it is doubtful that one can really say he or she loves. And let's just read a, just a little bit about, uh, again, John and uh, this particular epistle that he's writing to the church in Asia Minor here. And I really need for us to uh, I really want for us to get this on today, um, considering uh, the status of our society uh, and, and the things that's going on. We really need to grasp hold of this lesson on today. Like all of our Sunday school lessons, uh, this lesson is timely. It, it is something that we vitally need right now. So I just invite us to uh, just pay attention and to absorb what the Lord is going to tell us on this day. Now, just a little bit more about John and this epistle. God is light. God is love. And God is light. John is enjoying a delightful fellowship with that God of light, love and light. And he desperately desires his spiritual children enjoy the same fellowship. God is light. Therefore, to engage in fellowship with him, we must walk in light and not in darkness. As we walk in the light, we will regularly confess our sins, allowing the blood of Christ to continually cleanse us. Two major roadblocks to hinder this walk will be falling in love with the world and falling for the alluring lies of false teachers. God is love. Since we are his children, we must walk in love. In fact, John says, if we do not love, we do not know God. Love is more than just words. It is action. Love is giving, not giving. Biblical love is unconditional in its nature. Christ's love fulfills those qualities, and when that brand of love characterizes us, we will be free of self-condemnation and experience confidence before God. God is light. Those who fellowship with him must possess his quality of life. Spiritual life begins with spiritual birth, which occurs through faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ infuses us with God's light, which is eternal life. As we get into the lesson, as I stated, um, some things was going on back in the church of Edifice. Um, they were receiving some, uh, some, some false teaching, and John was concerned about this. So he was writing this letter as a reminder uh, to the Christians there at Edifice about what Jesus had said, uh, what he remembered what Jesus had said in the upper room uh, 50 years prior to this. And we're going to get into more of that uh, as we get into this lesson here. We're going to start off, um, we're just going to take the scriptures uh, one by one. We're not going to read it in its entirety. We're just going to go one, uh, uh, scripture by scripture and elaborate on that and uh, move forward from that. So we know now we're, we're in the um, first John, the third chapter, 
verses 1 through 24. And you notice that um, it starts with verse uh, number 11. So you, and so in that third chapter, you have uh, verses 1 through 10. And so basically what that was, uh, verses 1 through 10 was talking about, it was, it was in, in this um, third chapter, uh, it was talking about that brotherly love, about um, just loving one another, you know, um, as the commandment had given us to do so. And I just want to uh, just read uh, number 9 and number 10, and then we'll go right into uh, number 11. Number 9, whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. And number 10, in this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whatever does not practice, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does, the, does not love his brother. Let's just give a little bit of background so we can go right into our printed text. For today, and our printed text started starts with number eleven, and it reads: "For this is the message of He, of that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another." Let me read that again. This is the message that ye heard from the beginning that we should love one another. The, the beginning that John refers to is, is the teaching among his readers. This message here, uh, it has not evolved, it has not changed. Um, it's the basic message, message that we should love one, uh, one another. Um, Furthermore, uh, this key concept can be found in the teachings of, of Jesus. Uh, for instance, uh, John 13, uh, verses 34 through 35. Let's just take a look at that. John 13, that's, that's, the, that's the gospel of John, the 13th chapter, the 34th through the 30, 34th and 35th verse. And look, look at what it says right here. And we start, we're talking about the beginning, uh, loving from the beginning. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you love for one another. Um, what we just read there in John, the Gospel of John, it was in red. So those were the words of Jesus. He's commanding us to, to love one another. And what I thought about was uh, actually John, John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The scripture tells us that while we were yet sinners, uh, God, with his agape love, his eternal love, his, his all-consuming love, even though we were yet sinners, God allowed his son Jesus to come into this world to shed his blood that we might be reconciled back to him. That is just... the. The love of God is, is just so awesome. And, and that love as a believer should embody every Christian so they'll be able to walk in light and not in darkness. And that is what we need in times like these. Verse number 12. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him because his own works were evil and his brother's righteousness. Now, in Genesis, we, we've heard of the, the story between Cain and Abel, how Cain, uh, he rose up and, and slew his brother. 
Um, it was out of envy. It was out of jealousy. It was out of, out of wickedness. Um, just going back very quickly, um, Cain, he was a tiller of the field. Uh, so he grew vegetables and crops and things of that nature. Abel, uh, he, he raised animals. It came to uh, a time where they presented a sacrifice before the Lord. Um, Cain's sacrifice, it was, even though it was grain, there's nothing wrong with giving a grain offering, but what we're going to see is it's the manner in which you do give. So Cain's grain offering was refused or rejected by the Lord, while Abel's animal sacrifice was received by, by the Lord. So this anger came. And uh, like I say, he rose up and he slew his brother Abel because of this. And, and my friends, we, we have to be careful. We have to be mindful uh, that we stay in, the, in a Christ-like spirit at all times. I remember when I was younger, I remember uh, my uncle telling me that it's not what you do, it's how you do it. When we come before the Lord, and or when we do something for our brothers and sisters as a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must give it in a righteous spirit, in a right spirit, one that honors God, one that does not have back motives, one uh, that does not have a agenda on the other side, but just doing out of it out of love because God himself is love and he required that's how he requires us to do these things moving on to verse number 13 marvel not my brother if the world hate you all right marvel not don't wonder don't be perplexed don't be confused my brother if the world hates you when john wrote of the world he meant something more specific and sinister than the general populace. The world represents those who are in rebellion against God, defiantly sinning against God's command, that they have rejected God's rule for living and resent any restrictions on their freedom, freedom to sin. The world's hatred of the church flows out of its hatred for God himself, the people of God, will never be accepted by those who reject God. Such hatred of righteousness by the unrighteous has changed little in the thousands of years since Cain and Abel. This ancient dynamic persists in the way the world views the church. I, I don't know about you, but I have been, because you are a Christian. People are looking at you because as a Christian, you should be light. You should be salt of the earth. And sometimes as a Christian, uh, people watch you and they judge you or pass judgment on you. And they simply don't like you because you're too nice. I've been told that you, you're too nice. Um, as a believer, it is my job. It is my duty. Because I do love Christ, I want to do the right thing. I do love others. And I do want to be salt. I do want to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. But here, uh, John is telling us, marvel not, my brother, if the world hates you, it's okay. All you have to do is the right thing. No matter what you come against, uh, no matter what comes against you, uh, know that God is with you. And like we read earlier, he will never leave you nor forsake you, but he will be with you even until the end of the world. I just encourage you to keep your hands in God's unchanging hands and everything will be all right. 
I'm going to read 14, verse number 14. It, is, it has an A part and a B part, and uh, I, I'm just going to group those two together. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abides in death. Now, this goes back to a little bit about what we were talking about on, on last week uh, in, in the book of John. And I just want to read uh, a little bit about what we talked about. And, and we talked about uh, abiding in love and uh, just staying connected um, to Jesus, you know, who, who, that is our source. And we need to, if we are to be viable, if we are to be of any effect to non-believers, we have to stay connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm just going to read a little bit, uh, John 15, uh, verses uh, 12 through 14. Uh, I'm going to make that uh, 12 through 15. It says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servant, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I call you friends, for all things I heard from my Father, I have made known to you what a mighty God we serve. Now, dealing with these uh, passages of scriptures here, um, it says, while the world is dead in its wickedness and hatred, believers have moved from death unto life. This fact calls and then empowers Christians to love each other, a sign of genuine life in Christ. And when I was reading uh, these two, this passage of scripture here, uh, one of the things that I thought about uh, actually was baptism. I thought about bat baptism and the, and the way we see baptism, the it, it's the outward showing or the the outward confession that you're connected to the Lord Jesus Christ and that when in the Baptist church we fully submerge we don't, we don't sprinkle you, you're submerged fully under the water during baptism and that represents the life death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ when you come up you know it, it represents a change it represents a resurrection where you have died to your died to the sins, you have died to uh, the ways of the world, and you take it on this new life, this life which is in, in Christ Jesus. And when we take on this new life, which is in Christ Jesus, you know, we're able to do what it, it says here in in, uh, in fourteen, the B part of fourteen: He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. So if you're hanging on to those old ways of uh, wickedness, unrighteousness, uh, unforgiveness, uh, you're walking in death, or, or you're, you, uh, it says you are, you are abiding in death. And so as the Christian, again, we want to show the world, show Jesus Christ, the word says that we should be ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. And an ambassador is one that represents uh, someone else. And if we are to represent Christ, we are to walk in light that others may see that light and be led out of darkness. Moving on to verse number 15 now. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Here it says, Jesus taught that anger and disrespectful behavior are comparable to, to murder. So here, we're not really even talking about physically uh, murdering a person. 
But it says disrespectful behavior are comparable to comparable to to murder. Uh, when you scandalize someone's name, when you when you lie on someone, you are actually murdering that person. It says here, anger and hate feed one another. Listen to that now. Anger and hate feed one another. Human anger does not produce God's righteousness. Unchecked and unresolved anger may indeed lead to violence and even murder, things that should have no place in the church. Again, like I said at the beginning, uh, this message is uh, very timely. Uh, this message is a call uh, directly to uh, the believer that we need to, like never before, you know, we need the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to, to lead and to guide us and, and, and to direct us that we may not get caught up in what's going on in the world, that we may be that change in the world through the Lord Jesus Christ. Number 16, hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brother. Here it says that uh, Jesus' Jewish opponents hounded and threatened him throughout his ministry. If Jesus had decided to let his emotions turn into a murderous hate, he had far greater resources than whatever murder weapon can use. Jesus could have summoned thousands of war angels to exact his vengeance, but he didn't. Instead, he willingly died for the sake of all people, including his killers. Think about that. The whole purpose of Jesus coming into this world, he came like I said before, to shed his blood. He came to fulfill a sin debt, a debt that we ourselves could in no wise repay ourselves, no matter what good works we do, uh, no matter our, our deeds. We ourselves couldn't redeem ourselves back to God. It took the blood of Jesus shedding on Calvary so, so we could be reconciled back to God. And just, I want us just to, it, it's, it's almost mind-boggling, but it, then again, it's not. I'm, the love of God that, again, while we were yet sinners, the very ones that killed Jesus, he loved the very ones that were mocking him, he still loved them. Not only he loved them, he died for them. And that, as a Christian, that is the example for us. No matter what's going on, don't let your feelings, don't let your, don't get caught up in your, your feelings or emotions, you know. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the cross. And, just, and we have to press forward to that. It's a higher calling for us because we are to be that example. So don't, don't worry about if people are, are talking about you. Don't worry about if they want to murder you with their tongue, you know. Just give it to Jesus and he'll make everything all right. I promise you he will. Verse number 17. But whosoever hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him. That's verse number 17. And, and as I was reading um, um, this passage of scripture, um, one of the things I thought about, uh, past, one of Pastor Small's um, sermons, I, I thought about that. Uh, the title of the sermon was, Will You Bind My Wounds? 
and was talking about the uh, uh, the road from Jericho. It talked about the Good Samaritan, and, and it talked about the priest and the Levite. You know how they passed by on the other side and, and would not help uh, uh, the. Uh, this fallen person, but the good Samaritan, but the Samaritan, you know, had compassion and he seen the need. And so, in matter of fact, this was in our Sunday school lesson a couple of weeks ago. This, this, was, this was in our Sunday school lesson a couple of weeks ago. It's, it's that, that sacrificial love, you know, even though, you know, they, they have no dealings, but they had no dealings with each other, you know. This Samaritan took the time to bind up the man's wound, put him on his own beast, take him to an inn, pay for it, and told the innkeeper, if I, if I owe you anything else, if, it, if it's more than what I've already given you, I'll pay you on my return trip. That's that sacrificial love. And this is the kind of love that we have to have, that compassionate love. Again, another thing that I thought about was on, on verse number 17 here, about having the means, especially as a Christian, having the means to help someone that is in need. You can, you can clearly see that they're in need. And you don't do it. You pass by the person on the street. Perhaps they're homeless. Uh, they're hungry. And they ask you for some substance or, or resource because they are hungry. It might be just, you know, can you buy me a sandwich? Can you just give me a few dollars, you know, so I can get by for right now? And the person responds, I'll pray for you. You, you see a person in need. You have the means to help them because it, if you do it, it's not going to hurt you at all. But instead, you say, I'll pray for you. We, we really need to look in ourselves and, and seek guidance from God, you know. It, and we should do this every morning. And you, or at least one thing about you, you know. Um, I ask the Lord to guide me throughout the day because God, and one of the things that I do ask, I ask God, in which he already does anyway, I say, go ahead of me. Go before me, Lord. Because God already knows what we're going to encounter on that day anyway. So we need to ask him, you know, prepare my heart to... Uh, prepare my mind, you know, for whatever uh, circumstances uh, we may face, even if we come in contact with someone that needs some substance, you know. It, just, just have that giving heart, you know, that the, the heart of Christ and, and that he gave his life for us. And surely we can help someone else out. So in verse number 17, uh, don't, don't shut up your bowels, you know. Don't, don't, don't do things that God would not be pleased with. But instead, do the things that he would be pleased with in being that Christian. Number 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Here. Okay, uh, John here, again, like I said before, um, 50 years earlier, you know, he was in the upper room with Jesus. So he, John has aged someone here, and you notice he, he's referring to uh, the Christians here, uh, the people at Oedipus, my little children. And he's admonishing them, let us not love in word neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Listen to this right here. Any claim for loving God should result in observable 
Observal deeds of compassion for others. Lack of concern for the needy brings the entire status of a Christian in question. John used truth here in the sense of veracity and verifiable actions. He also taught that love for God and hate for others cannot coexist. John knows that these stern words might convict some of their unfaithful deeds, so he spoke with urgency to his little children. This, his beloved flock, again, back then they had these false teachers. Although false teachers seem unworried about physical actions as evidence of, their, of faith, John insisted that loving behavior is the only way to really demonstrate love in one's heart. And again, if you say you love someone, love is definitely, uh, it isn't, it's an action word. That means, uh, if, but the scripture says, just don't give, uh, kind of paraphrasing, just don't give uh, lip service and, and say all these fruity, wonderful things that sound good and you have no deeds uh, to, to back them up. Just, it, the love is just not in your heart, you know, if you do those things. Moving on to verse number 19. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. And know that you are in Christ. John offers a test to determine whether we are of the truth. To be of the truth is John's way of saying our actions prove we are not acting with guile or deceit, but with godly sincerity and honesty. We should pay attention to our heart, but not as an infallible guide. The heart in biblical thought is not simply the center of emotions. The heart is the source of our deepest impulses, our motivations, our free will decisions. It is where we make choices. So, my brothers and sisters, guard your heart. Verse 20. For if our heart condemns us, God is not greater in our heart and knowing all things. In verse number 20, um, a heart that condemns may be rightly convicting us of sin that has not been rooted out. This seems especially to be what John had in mind. If our hearts condemn us, then God has even more reason to condemn us because he sees our hearts and even more clearly than we do. But check this out. Yet, John's encouragement is that God is greater than our heart. Our inner voice can be misleading an embodiment of our self-centered tendencies or shameful previous behavior. God sees not only what our hearts tell us, but also what he knows about us. His great love does not condemn us when we are in Christ. And that's what I was saying earlier about how it's, it's just almost mind-boggling, you know, the love of God that he has towards us. Let's just think about that for a minute. And, when, and the, the scriptures tells us that, you know, while we were yet sinners, you know, while we were yet disobedient, while we were yet wayward towards God, he still loved us. He loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. Who wouldn't serve a mighty God like that? Verse number 21. Beloved, if our heart condemns us not, then have we confidence towards God. And that's what our lesson is about right here. It's about confident love. Confident love. 
Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Basically, if the heart does not condemn us, does not resist helping the needy with acts of love, we should feel confident in our relationship with God. We have tamed the heart of stony selfishness and allowed it to be a soft heart of obedience and kindness. The hard heart is liable for the judgmental wrath of God. When we act in kindness for others, we show that we have a new heart, the heart recreated by God's grace. Thank goodness for God's grace. And one of the things that I, I thought about here was, um, I thought about David in uh, Psalms, and he said, uh, Lord, create in me a clean heart and, and renew a right spirit in me. And we, we know the stories of David, you know, uh, a, a great man of war. Um, but David had blood on his hands. And yet, even though he had blood on his hands and uh, he continually uh, messed up, um, David knew how to repent. That's one thing about David. He knew how to repent. And, you know, he realized he had messed up. He said, Lord, create in me a clean heart. At that center, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. And, and that's, how, that's, how, that's how we got to go through this life, you know. Uh, we have to have a, a repentant heart. When you mess up, turn back to God. Just ask him uh, for his forgiveness. And it says here in 22, in, going back to 21 real quick, um, because you do have a good heart and your heart does not condemn you, you know, um, it's about that boldness going before God, you know, and with that confidence, you know, whatever you ask of him, that we, he will do it according to his will. Verse 22, and whatever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Here, the path forward for the believer is to ask the right things of God and do the right things for God. We are self-testing when we look at these things critically. When we pray, do we pray for things necessary to do God's will? When we ask, do our actions please God rather than disappoint him? Uh, and that's what we talked about earlier, you know. Um, let our motives, let our actions, let our deeds, um, let them be righteous that they honor God and, and that we do be light and that we do be salt uh, in the earth. T 23, um, it has an A part and a B part. Again, I'm going to group those two together. 23. And in this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Um, again, that commandment came, we, we talked about it um, in John uh, 15. Um, John 13, verses um, 33 and 34. We, we talked about that commandment. Now, okay, when we're talking about the belief um, in, in Jesus Christ, and, uh, we, we're always going to refer back to John 3, 16. To believe on the name of his son Jesus and to love one another cannot be disconnected from each other. True believers in Jesus Christ will practice mutual love always. Jesus mentioned this repeatedly on his final night he spent with his disciples in the upper room. Many decades later, and we talked about probably about 50 years, John showed us that he had not forgotten his master's words of that night. 
Despite the many problems and challenges of the churches, John addressed his controlling ethic never lost his power or authority. John did what the lesson talked about last week. It's, it's, it's about uh, uh, abiding in that love, just staying connected to God in all situations. Here, um, as we go to verse number 24, um, this is our um, fo a focal verse of today's lesson. Verse number 24 reads, And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. It says here that we know we are in fellowship with God if we keep his commandments. Matter of fact, the scripture says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. We see evidence of our obedience when our lives show that we are loving one another faithfully. The Spirit abides in us, changing our hearts so that we keep the commands from keep the commands from pure motives, not just fear of punishment. Again, just doing the right thing because it's the right thing uh, to do. Um, this lesson. Again, it's a very uh, timely lesson, and uh, I encourage us um, to stay focused and to stay diligent uh, in, in, this, in this time right here. Um, as always, at the end of the lesson, you know, um, I always like to leave you with a, a golden nugget. And the golden nugget that I want to leave with you on this day is about self-sacrificing love. Self-sacrificing love. Knowing that it is not about you and that it is about others. And doing things in love and out of love for one another. To help your brothers and sisters out. And I always believe in humanity. What can you do for humanity? What can you do for your brothers and sisters? To help out humanity too. Because you do love one another. Because you do have that sacrificing, self-sacrificing love. And, and what's going on now? Please. Just wear your mask. Because of love, just wear your mask to help somebody else out. Remember, it's, it's not about you. It's always about that other person and loving that other person through the love of Christ. On next week, next week's lesson uh, is going to be November the 22nd. And we're going to be talking about sharing love. It's going to be Bible study guide number 12. Um, our Bible background is going to be coming from Acts 4.32 uh, and then five, uh, uh, chapter 5, verse number 11. Our printed text is going to be Acts, uh, the fourth chapter, the 32nd verse through the 5th chapter, the 11th verse. Our devotional reading is going to be coming from 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verses uh, 1 through 10. And, um, it, it, and if you read it, it's going to be kind of like a continuation of what we talked about today, how um, all of them uh, got together. They pulled, they sold their goods and pulled their resources together Distributed that so they they'll be able to, they were able to help each other out and that's what we need to do in, in times like these help each other out allow the love of Christ to be in your hearts to guide and to rule you and to lead you let us pray Father we come now in the name of Jesus just giving you thanks 
Just give me an honor. Just praise you and glorify you for you have been so good to us. You have been so kind to us. You have been better to us than we've been to our own selves. And for that, we just want to say thank you. Now, God, we just ask that you allow your Holy Spirit to continue, Lord God, to abide in our hearts and our minds, Lord God, that we may go forth and do the things that you have commanded us to do. Father, we love you. We bless you. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Truth and Triumph is God's ultimate plan for our lives. The Bell Grove Missionary Baptist Church, 2300 Edgefield, Highway North, Aiken, South Carolina, invites you to join us every Sunday for a Truth and Triumph worship experience. Pastor Lester A. Smalls is a man with a testimony who preaches and teaches the gospel of Jesus Christ with such soundness and clarity even a baby can understand it. Seeking true worship, great fellowship, and sound doctrine? Join us at Bell Grove. We're located in North Aiken County. We are also convenient to the surrounding cities of Edgefield, Johnston, Ridge Springs, and North Augusta. Worship every Sunday with Sunday School at 9.30 a.m., Devotion and Praise at 10.30 a.m., and Call to Worship at 11 a.m. Also, join us for the Truth and Triumph Word Ministry every Monday night at 9 p.m. on WAAW 94.7 FM Radio. We can be reached at 803-649-1706 or bellgrovebaptist.org or on Facebook.